Today is the fourth Sunday of Lent. Our Lady of New York Mouse Parish is part of a national organization called the Catholic Apostolic Church in North America, or Casina, as we are known. We are also the new Baltimore chapter of Dignity USA, which is dedicated to sacramental and social justice, specifically for the LGBTQ plus community and their families and friends. Our parish's vision is to rebuild Christ's church by seeking out and providing and accepting, accommodating, and aspirational spiritual home for disenchanted, disengaged, and disaffected Catholics and others. All who come with respect are welcome here. Let us take a moment now to pause, be silent, and place ourselves in the presence of God as we prepare for the liturgy to begin. Let us pray that by growing in love this Lenten season, 
we may bring the peace of Christ to our world. God our Father, your word, Jesus Christ, spoke peace to a sinful world and brought humankind the gift of reconciliation by the suffering and death he endured. Teach us, the people who bear his name, to follow the example he gave us. May our faith, hope, and charity turn hatred to love, conflict to peace, death to eternal life. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. First reading is a reading from the second book of Chronicles. All the leading priests and the people who were exceedingly unfaithful, following all the abominations of the nations, and they polluted the house of the Lord that he had consecrated in Jerusalem. The Lord, the God of their ancestors, persistently sent his message to them because he had compassion on his people and on his dwelling place. But they kept mocking the messengers of God, despising his words and scoffing at his prophets until the wrath of the Lord against his people became so great that there was no remedy. Therefore the Lord brought up against them the king of the Chaldeans, who burned the house of God, broke down the walls of Jerusalem, burned all its palaces with fire, and destroyed all its precious vessels. The king took into exile in Babylon those who had escaped from the sword, and they became servants to him and to his sons until the establishment of the kingdom of Persia to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah until the land had made up for its Sabbaths. All the days that it lay desolate, it kept Sabbath to fulfill 70 years. In the first year of King Cyrus of Persia, in fulfillment of the word of the Lord spoken by Jeremiah, the Lord stirred up the spirit of King Cyrus of Persia, so that he sent a herald throughout all the kingdom, and also declared in a written edict. Thus says King Cyrus of Persia, the Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and has charged me to build him a house at Jerusalem which is in Judah. Whoever is among you of all his people, may the Lord his God be with him. Let him go up. The word of the Lord. Thanks Thank be you, God. God. Jerusalem, 
Let my right hand wither. Let my tongue cling to my mouth if I do not remember you. Let my tongue cling to the roof of my mouth if I do not remember you. If I do not set Jerusalem above my highest joy. Let my tongue cling to my mouth if I do not remember you. The second reading is a reading from the letter of St. Paul to the Ephesians. God, who is rich in mercy, out of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead through our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. For it is by grace that you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the ages to come, God might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God. This is not the result of works, so that no one may boast, for we are what he has made us, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand to be our way of life. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Please stand. We are um, experiencing, once again, technical sound difficulties, so I'm going to move a little further that way, and I'd rather you guys not move my back. That's all. It just seems no matter what we try to do, something screws up. And right now, our directional speaker or microphone doesn't seem to be working. So I beg it very close if you're going to hear it. Thank you all for coming. 
As I said, this is the fourth Sunday in Lent. It's also known as Letare Sunday. That's a word in Latin that means rejoice. Letare Sunday sits here right in the middle of our penitential season of Lent, where we're called to prayer and good works and almsgiving in order to bring about that deep change of heart and mind, the scriptures call metanoia. It is midway into Lent because the church in her wisdom wants to keep us having our eyes on the prize. All this serious reflection and introspection, after all, has as its ultimate goal the joy-filled celebration of our redemption in the resurrected Christ. And so today, instead of the somberness of purple vestments, I get to wear pink. And although for me personally, I don't think pink is my color, one must admit, that has to make you smile. Makes you a little brighter. One might even say, gives you a feeling of being gay. <laughs> so RuPaul, my dear, you can just sashay away. Because I think it's pretty good. Say you made you smart. You made you smart. You're all smart. Anyway, today is, oh, don't tell me you've never looked at RuPaul's Drag Race. Don't, don't, don't any of you do that. Anyway, today is called Laetari Sunday because of the original entrance hymn of the Mass for that day, a prayer we used to call the Atroid. We are called to rejoice. Rejoice with Jerusalem and be glad for her. All of you who delight in her, exalt and sing for joy with her. And all of you who in sadness mourn for her, may you nurse and be satisfied with the breast of her consolation. So this Sunday calls us to rejoice, to smile a bit, to relax, Everything is in God's hands. Everything is good. And in the end, everything will end well. Despite how unusual the plan might be to get there. And that's the message of our first reading. From the book of Chronicles, the second book of Chronicles. That book is probably the underlying framework for what is our fourth Eucharistic prayer, which I'll say tonight. It's a passage that recounts the history of the people of Israel and their persistent unfaithfulness to God and his covenant. It tells how all the people, from the high and the mighty, to the poor and the lowly, added infidelity to infidelity, practicing all the abominations of the nations and polluting the world Lord's temple, which he had consecrated in Jerusalem. And over and over again, our compassionate and faithful God sent his messengers and prophets to them. But over and over again, they mocked those messengers and they scoffed at those prophets. Until the anger of the Lord let his protection of them just stand down. And Babylon swooped in, destroyed everything, with the people themselves going off into slavery for the second time in their history since they left the bondage of Egypt. But the reading goes on to say that no matter how many times we are unfaithful to God, no matter how many times we sin, no matter how many times we act out of selfishness and depravity, no matter how many times we refuse to love, God, on the other hand, does not abandon us. God comes back over and over and over again with a new offer of relationship a new offer of covenant, a new offer of blessing, a new offer of love. God always finds a way to love because it is God's very nature to love. As St. John says, God is love. God is a God who cannot not love. Hence, we truly do have a reason to rejoice. Rejoice with Jerusalem, because, as the Chronicles say, God again came to the rescue and sent the most unlikely and most unusual a deliverer, a Persian king, 
Cyrus to free the people, to rebuild the city, to restore the Holy Temple. By the way, as a little aside, when you think about the animosity among the countries of the Middle East, it goes way back. Babylon is Iraq. Persia is Iraq. So they've been at each other for quite some time. There's a similar reason to rejoice in the gospel from St. John. This episode takes place at night in a house where Jesus was staying and he receives his visitor, Nicodemus. It's actually a very, very long conversation between the two of them. The first part of this conversation is a dialogue where they both talk with each other. Tonight's reading is the second part of that meeting and it's more of a monologue with Jesus doing almost all the talking. In the part of the story that precedes our reading tonight, there's an interesting fact. Nicodemus came under the cover of darkness. In other words, he came at a time when nobody would see him enter. He was a Pharisee, after all, a member of the religious ruling class, one of those who determined and managed the temple. He had more than likely witnessed the earlier events when Jesus cleansed the temple with a whip, opening the stalls and freeing the animals, overturning the tables of the money changers, and screaming that his father's house is a house of prayer, but you priests, you Pharisees, like Nicodemus, had turned it into a marketplace. Remember last Sunday I said, it was interesting that no one tried to stop Jesus when he did that rampage, probably because there were many others there who realized that the practices of the temple had become corrupt and an abomination. They were not the practices that facilitated prayer. They did not lead to holiness as God had intended. It's possible that Nicodemus was one of those in descent, and having witnessed the heroism of Jesus and the courage and riskiness of Jesus, wanted to get to know more about it. So coming at night is probably a good indication that he really didn't want to be seen by anybody else. Coming out of the closet, if you will, as a member of the descent, would have not gone well for Nicodemus. And so he approached the scene. But the darkness from which Nicodemus comes also represents his ignorance his ignorance of God's plan. Nicodemus emerges out of darkness, out of the darkness of ignorance, into the light of the Lord. And in the earlier part of that conversation, Jesus tries to explain to him that he has come to show people how loved they are by God. To see that reality clearly, they must experience deep change, metanoia, repentance. So radical a change that they must be born anothen in Greek, which means again, or from above. And Nicodemus understands this literally and questions, how can this be? How can it be possible for a person to re-enter his mother's womb and be born a second time? So Jesus clarifies and tells him that no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and the spirit. And he goes on to say, what is born of the flesh is flesh, and what is born of the spirit is spirit. And do not be astonished that I say to you, you must be born again from above. Talk about that to him. And hence begins the lecture that we just now read. Jesus tells Nicodemus that the only one who can come into the kingdom of God, into heaven, is he who came from heaven in the first place. Jesus is the word of God who was in the beginning. Through him all things were made. And he knows about heaven. He's been there. Being with the Father and with him and the Spirit is what heaven is. What he's telling Nicodemus is that he is the way into that realm of new and eternal life. And then Jesus makes an interesting reference back to the book of Numbers the story of the people in the desert under Moses, who, like generations later described in Chronicles, had gravely sinned with ingratitude, complaining about the living conditions in the desert and wishing they had not been delivered from Egypt. 
And like Babylon, God withdraws his protection and the camp soon finds itself overwhelmed by an invasion of deadly snakes. The venom and a bite from any of these snakes would lead to a really painful death. And so the people come to Moses and ask him to plead for God's help. And God tells Moses, construct an image of the serpent made of bronze. Put it on a pole so that all can see it. And those who looked at that bronze serpent with repentance found healing from the deadly venom. That bronze serpent was a symbol of the people's sin. And in order to be delivered from it, in order to experience metanoia, God required them to look at it boldly straight on, to look at their sin in the daylight and to see it for what it is. Sin is like deadly venom. And to obtain forgiveness for our sinfulness, we must first help to look at it. Sin is what pulls us away from the light of God into darkness. And Jesus is telling us that there are some people who simply love being in darkness. But for the rest of us, Paul is to repent. He also is telling us that it is he who has come to deliver us into the light of God's grace. And for that to happen, like the bronze serpent, he has to be lifted up high on that cross of Calvary, having taken all of our sins onto himself so that we can gaze upon him and understand the pain we have caused God. We have to look at him and our sins that he bears boldly and straight on in the bright light of day to see it for what it is. Like Cyrus, the Persian king who delivered Israel from that captivity in Babylon, and like this bronze serpent in the desert who healed those with venom in their veins, Jesus, crucified as a condemned criminal, is also an unusual and unexpected way to bring about salvation. But that's how it is with God. Unusual and unexpected. Believing in Jesus and acting accordingly is the only way that we will be saved. And the reason God would do this, says Jesus, is that because he so loved the world that he gave us his only son so that everyone who believes in him might not perish but have eternal life. St. Paul says it a different way. God who is rich in mercy because of the great love he has for us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, brought us to life in Christ. This new life in Christ is freely offered. It has turned us into, as Paul says, his handiwork, created in Christ Jesus for good works that God has prepared in advance that we should live in them. It is up to us to fulfill our role as his handiwork, and it is up to us to resonate with the gifts of the saving grace by playing it forward to others. Nicodemus must have experienced becoming God's handiwork having looked deeply at Jesus that night and experiencing the deep change of heart and mind that it brings. Because the next time we hear about him, it's at that very cross on which Jesus was lifted up and died. Where he and Joseph of Arimathea approached Pilate and asked for the Lord's body, which they then took and anointed and laid in Joseph's newly carved tomb. Nicodemus no longer needed the cover of darkness to do that. He walked right up the pilot in the clear view of his fellow Pharisees, in the bald light of day, and asked for the Savior of the world. That is how metanoia works. It clears the venom greed and avarice, dishonesty and hate from our veins, from our heart, as we gaze on the crucified Lord. And that image becomes emblazoned where once sin resided in our hearts. And 
And that is something to rejoice in. And that, my friends, is what Lent is all about. May God bless you. Join me in the second. We believe in one God, the Father, the Lord, 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 for us, and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he was even more than the Virgin Mary, he became king of you. For our sake, he was crucified and crucified. He suffered, died, and was buried. On the third day, he rose again, fulfilled those scriptures. He ascended into heaven, and then seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father, with the Father and the Son, and the Spirit is worshiped and glorified, he has have spoken from the prophets. We believe in one one of the Holy Catholics out of charge of the church. We acknowledge the baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look at the resurrection of the dead, and the light of the Lord has come. Amen. My friends, let us rejoice. As we enter into the spirit of Netanoia, we are grateful for all the Lord has bestowed on us and are cognizant of those who have blessed. We turn to the Lord with grateful hearts. For a deep change of our minds and hearts toward God through prayer and fasting, we pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord hear our prayer. Lord. For peace in our world and an end to hatred and oppression, we pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord, hear our prayer. For our families and all that they have done for us, and for all families, especially those under duress, we pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord hear our prayer. For the gift of healing for all who are sick <coughs> and comfort for the dying, we pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord hear our prayer. For the gift of new life for the deceased, we pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord, hear our prayer. For our nation, that it may put division aside and renew our sense of justice, we pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord, Lord hear our prayer. For an end to the pandemic that is ravaging our world, for the scientists and doctors working on cures and treatments, and for healthcare workers and first responders, that they may be protected as they serve our communities, and in thanksgiving for the miracle of the vaccines, that are beginning to provide hope. We pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord, hear our prayer. For all those who support our parish and our mission with their time, talent, and treasure, we pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord hear our prayer. For all those prayers we hold in our hearts, and for all those prayers and all those people who have petitioned our Lady and Guru of Knox by way of our website, especially for Dwight Burgess, Bobby Strong, for Steve Pop, Martha's mother, and Karen Conrad, for Lisa Staley and Chris Bowery's mother, for Bob Scales, Angel Bishop, and Chris Emery's mother, for whom or what else do we wish to pray this evening? For Al's nephews and niece's grandfather who had a stroke this afternoon. Mr. Hearn. For those that have been vaccinated and those that are getting vaccinated, may they have little side effects and may we all look forward to the day when we can get vaccinated. For 
blessings on the scene. The blessings on dignity and on the living waters of the For those who struggle with mental health issues and addiction, that they can find support and encouragement from our Lord and from those around them. For all of these prayers, Spoken and unspoken, we pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord, hear our prayer. Loving Father, you alone are the source of life, and you abundantly bless your creation with happiness and joy. May we always turn to you in thanksgiving for all that we are and all that we have received through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Lord Jesus Christ, you said to your apostles, I leave you peace, by peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church, and grant us the peace and unity of your kingdom where you live forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Peace of the Lord be with you all. And all of us are here. all for each other. Sign. Blessed are you, Lord, God of all creation, for your goodness we have this bread to offer. The truth has given in human hands of me will become for us the bread of God. Bless us, God, our prayer. By the mystery of this water and wine, may we come to share in the divinity of Christ, who humble himself to share in our humanity. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation, for your goodness we have this wine to offer. For the divine and work of human hands, it will become our spiritual drink. Blessed be God forever. Lord God, we ask you to receive us and be pleased with the sacrifice we offer you with humble and contrite hearts. Lord, wash your mind and be blessed. Pray, brethren, that our sacrifice may be acceptable to God, the Almighty God. May the Lord accept that sacrifice in your hand for the praise and glory of God's name, for our good and good of all God's church. Lord, we offer you these gifts which bring us peace and joy. Increase our reverence by this Eucharist and bring salvation to the world. We ask this in the name of Jesus, the Lord. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also, also with you. lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is great to give God thanks and praise. Father, all powerful and ever living God, we do well always and everywhere to give you thanks. Through our observance of Lent, you correct our faults and raise our minds to you. You help us grow in holiness and offer us the reward of everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Through him, the angels and all the choirs of angels worship it all before your presence. May our voices be one with theirs as they sing with joy the hymn of your glory. <laughs>
and love. You formed us in your own likeness and set us over the whole world to serve you, our Creator, and to rule over all creatures. Even when we disobeyed you and lost your friendship, you did not abandon us to the power of death, but helped us to seek and find you. Again and again you offered us a covenant, and through the prophets taught us to hope for salvation. Father, you so loved the world that in the fullness of time you sent your only Son to be our Savior. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary, a human being like us in all things but sin. To the poor he proclaimed the good news of salvation, to prisoners freedom, and to those in sorrow joy. In fulfillment of your will, he gave himself up to death, but by rising from the dead, he destroyed death and restored life, that we might live no longer for ourselves but for him. He sent the Holy Spirit from you, Father, as his first gift to those who believe, to complete his work on earth and bring us to the fullness of grace. Father, may this Holy Spirit sanctify these offerings. Let them become the body and blood of Jesus Christ our Lord, as we celebrate the great mystery which he left us as an everlasting covenant. He always loved those who were his own in the world. When the time came for him to be glorified by you, his heavenly Father, he showed the depth of his love. While they were in supper, he took bread, said the blessing, broke the bread, he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat it. This is my body, which will be given up for you. In the same way, he took the cup filled with wine. He gave you thanks. And giving the cup to his disciples, said, Take this, all of you, and drink from it. This is the cup of my blood, the blood of the new and everlasting covenant. It will be shed for you and for all, so that sins may be forgiven. Do this in memory of me.
response. Our, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our bread and bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass our trespasses against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, from every evil, and grant us peace in our day. In your mercy, keep us free from sin and protect us from all anxiety as we wait in joyful hope for the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever.
you guys could hang around. It was something important that you talked about. Okay. I know John. Uh, let us pray. Father, you enlighten all who come into the world. Fill our hearts with the light of your gospel, that our thoughts may please you and our love be sincere. Grant this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. As we approach the icon to our lady and the doer of knots, let us join in song as we sing number 790, Immaculate Mary. Thank you. 